I want to welcome you to Module 8, our final module for this course. As individuals and a species, we've encountered mystery in that first cognitive and affective moment when we simultaneously raised our eyes to the stars and reflected this expanse within the pools of our own interiority. In opposite manner, mystery can be clouded or seemingly inaccessible at times of great societal strife. For instance, in the 20th century, a generation of thinkers, including Paul Tillich, Karl Barth, Hannah Arndt, and more, could not unfix their existential gaze from the atrocities of two world wars. You might say that a cohort of scholars and practitioners experienced a collective post-traumatic stress that infected a generation of thinkers. But trauma is also capable of fueling a generative response toward healing and a return to general well-being and flourishing. What was required in the post-World War II advent of late modernity were thinkers like new mystics for our own age who responded to a world shaking at its foundations, as Tillich noted. These mystics showed courage by invoking an approach to mystery that was open to other disciplines, equally advancing the sciences and the faiths simultaneously, and by integrating them into a larger view of the cosmos and emerging new cosmology. How much of our current postmodern era is also experiencing or about to experience societal trauma? If those numbers will increase, and if we do have something in common then, perhaps, with these late modern thinkers, the likes of Tillich and Bart, think about that. In this module, we have examples of these new mystics who are attempting to integrate a viable human response to wonder and awe that makes use of scientific discovery all around us, from genomics to earth sciences and astronomy and more. In short, each of our writers for this present module, Vincy, Duffy, and Hout, make suggestions for the human response to an emerging cosmology. In two of these writings, I've chosen the work of Teilhard de Chardin as an exemplar of this kind of response being a new mystic. Let's look at Chardin. He's courageous in his thought, inclusive of both science and faith, and considers a new classical theological themes, such as eschatology, for instance, by claiming that humanity's narrative of hope resides in the evolving future and not in the events of history shrouded as they are in the past. For Chardin, the historical Jesus, for instance, waits in the past, but is evident in a future with Christ. From his Christian heritage, Chardin is a visionary who seeks God in the sacred reality of the cosmos. Now, as you know by now, my approach here is never to ask you to agree or disagree with Chardin on every point, or with me on every point. No, not at all. Instead, I'm interested in Chardin for this module because he is an exemplar of courage and vision, like Vinci and Hout. His attention to method is what I find most attractive. And what is this method, you ask? I'll tell you. Here it is. Chardin is bold because he is grounded in his historical tradition with a clear vision that aims to constellate a new narrative web of meaning or meaning making in the future for the sake of the present. And this is what I mean by the new mystic, the one who can capture classical truths that rupture the past, present, and future as imminent interpretive keys for understanding the unfolding sacred within the proximity of our, my, your lives. In every second, in every millisecond, the sacred is and is not mystery. To illustrate this point, I think of a photograph that NASA took of Earth from the Cassini spacecraft on July 19th, 2013. NASA asked that all the people of Earth, all of the Earthlings, look up to Saturn and wave at a particular time that evening, where across from a far ring of that planet, Cassini would snap a photograph. Now, I was in Jerusalem at the time, on top of a hotel with colleagues, waving my arms frenetically, I'm up to Saturn. Kind of funny, maybe a little ridiculous, but no less relevant, really. In the photograph from Cassini that evening, 
we witnessed the pale blue dot that we call home, little more than a pinprick of our sapphire with an ivory speck of moon whirling up from the lower right. Upon seeing the earth in this way, when I looked at the photograph, what struck me was a second photograph, in fact, that Cassini took that same evening. It was of a star over three light years away that was glowing like an incandescent Christmas orb in the heavens. Without the intrusive effects of an atmosphere, Cassini rendered that star as a gem of classical truth. Recall what we said about classical truths in this course. As a classic truth, that star appeared inextinguishable and as a source of emanating continuous symbolic light and power. It hung in the sky with an illuminating power that was beholden more to wonder and awe and maybe even love itself. It appeared to escape the gravity of a geocentric or earthbound appreciation of space and time so beholden to our daily transection of our native star. Our writers this week are seeking God in the sacred, in the universe, in bold fashion. Consider another image of the courageous leaders required today. They all exhibit the shared conceptual and methodological DNA. These thinkers, writers and leaders, are as bold as the first mitochondria within the eukaryotic cells, in which about two billion years ago, mitochondria became the equivalent of a high octane power center that one day began to respirate the cell in order to regulate cellular metabolism. In this phrase, mitochondrial respiration, you can hear the Greek spiritus, respirate, and spiritus. A theological argument can be made that mitochondria are the equivalent of a pneumatological inspiritedness of sorts, which inspires the creative activity of all of life, beginning before, but certainly even evident in, the respiration of the cellular mending. The lesson? All of life is yearning to Atman. You can hear Adam, as we noted in module one, to breathe. The first progenitor, the first human, to breathe into the world and excite the future from the liminality and limit of the present. All of these writers, like you, are already participating in our own cellular level, even, in the inspiration of the cosmos itself. So we might as well participate as a mutually minded generative source in the universe, kind of respirating inspiration to the universe. I chose these writers after all of these metaphors are done because they're bold, like mitochondria. So are you. In the readings, Vinci will focus on the recalibration of sacramental theology, and Duffy and Hout will focus on the reclamation of mystic wisdom and scientific rigor. Now consider Duffy's reconstruction of Teilhard de Chardin's reliance upon the wisdom tradition in our reading, Sophia Speaks, that's the title. Be aware, as you read this, that the rich Hebraic and Quranic emphases on Shekinah or Sakinah in Arabic, which is a term for a precursor, I should say, of the Christian interpretation of the Holy Spirit, all of this is at work in Duffy's assessment of Chardin's reliance upon wisdom as Sophia. Sophia in the Shekinah tradition, very old antiquated tradition, is a creative theological force of integrated divine care in the universe that is unique. It's a unique force, say, from the Roman understanding of fortuna. You should hear fortune in that, in the modern, in the modern part of that. Fortuna is a kind of random and lacking integration, whereas wisdom, Shekinah, that tradition, Sophia, draws together greater unity from chaos. Fortuna, or fortune, is an aggregate of disconnected particularities of chance in the universe. On the one hand, there is wisdom drawn toward unity. On the other, there's particularity drawn toward potential chaos. In Sophia Speaks, Duffy has given voice to Chardin's attempt to speak to the future by reinvigorating a part of the history of the past that is already ours in the first place. In this case, that past is the, is the recovery of the Shekinah wisdom tradition. Rediscovery 
of what we know to be true, that is the recovery of the mystics, is about the future, intimately aware of its past. In like manner, the wisdom of the ages, the sacred itself in Hebrew parlance, is in simultaneous relationship between the past, present, and future all the time. In some ways, what I just noted about wisdom is artificial and tediously linear when I say that it's evident in the past, present, and future all the time. The point is that wisdom or Sophia, or the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, if you look at the Christian self-understanding, speaks simultaneously in the human past, present, and future. Even as we in our own limit situation only experience divine or sacred voice in a linear liminality, or that is to say in our own short lives. This course has been meant to be a journey for you, for all of us. And what have we learned together? We've learned at least that any class that offers a topic on an emerging cosmology must be at home in paradigm shifts. We call this from module one. Such cosmology aware of paradigmatic shifts is freed up to interpret divine generosity and the human response anew. And emerging cosmology must demonstrate an awareness, as we have, of the dichotomies, sometimes tragic, between divine revelation and the lonely planet as a metaphor for human suffering and loss. That emerging cosmology, as we've discovered, must also make sense of the societal and even personal lies, ruse, or otherwise illusions that delude and yet appear normative in a world that requires meaning-making to be honest, and in a manner that exposes the dangerous lie so that we can have a future together. Ultimately, with a view to that future, is there divinity in the universe beyond the god of the gaps, as you recall? Yes, we can affirm, and did, that the human classical narrative is never interested in proving the cardboard, two-dimensional, waving, smiling, my buddy god, who apologized for taking up too much real estate in the realm of faith, even as pseudoscience appears to pave over the existence of God itself. No. To do so on the part of science and allow it to happen in terms of faith is hubris. It's bad faith. Look, mystery is all around us. Like dark matter, like matter for that matter, in the expanse of time and space and the intimacy of love itself, a force in the universe so often misunderstood, but to which all of our religious leaders continuously attest. You now are left with two tasks prior to completing the course. First, complete your paper two, the description of which you can locate in module eight. And second, just prior to your turning in your paper, you must complete the course evaluation in order to accrue an additional two points for your overall grade. Each point matters. And each course evaluation is essential. So please simply fill it out and send it to the email address noted in module eight. Do not send the evaluation to me. I see these later, only after the course is completed. But I can only grade your paper with, when the evaluation is completed. So please evaluate and then turn in your paper. And finally, it's been a joy. I want you to know, accompanying you through a class that I hope has been transformative to you. In final words, if I could leave you with any gift in terms of a prevailing value that I believe is essential to any full-blooded theological enterprise in the world today as a virtue that must inform our lives and leadership, it would be the gift of the value of kindness. Even more than courage, kindness derived from kindredness treats neighbors tenderheartedly like family, forgiving one another. It is a virtue without which emerging cosmologies will wither on the vine. In the future, we may rediscover that being kind is ultimately the shared cross-contextual virtue that is in the bedrock of our world, of any world, and of, it, and of any cosmos spinning around those worlds. Reach out to me with questions. Be kind to yourselves and to others. I'll see you soon.